the assault on the dragon's lair was going well. No longer would the people of this land be plagued by fear. As we approached the ancient temple steps, we felt the tremendous steps of something resonating within the earth. We held fast, looking to our angelic commander for courage. And this was when I realized how truly lost we were. Fear is not an emotion you often see in a mortal display. And the source of that fear would be our unknown. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of Dungeons and Dragons and bring them to light for use in your 5th edition game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be talking about a creature of epic proportions. I don't know why, but I was in the mood to cover something ridiculously over the top, but yet still usable. And I think today's creature fills both of those requirements. I present to you the Blue Spawn God Slayer. These 20 foot tall, 18,000 pound warriors were created for one purpose and one purpose only, to slay dragons, angels, demons, and otherwise any creatures that dragons might be afraid to actually go up against. If something actually has a chance of posing a real threat to a dragon, these guys are meant to fight back against it. Sometimes that even includes fighting other rival chromatic dragons. This creature can originally be found in the 3.5 Monster Manual 4, and then was originally transported into the 4th edition 1st Monster Manual. Something Wizards of the Coast did for the 4th edition Monster Manual that was kind of controversial because some people really didn't like these creatures, were create a bunch of dragon spawn that were meant to be dragon-esque creatures that weren't actually dragons. Essentially a bunch of creatures that could be used as servants for their dragon masters. The reason this was kind of controversial was because they put out a whole bunch of ecology about these creatures and all that stuff and it just took up a huge amount of space in the book. So like almost half the book ended up just being about dragon spawn and all about how they live and where they're from and like battle maps and stuff about dragon layers and that kind of thing. Which is pretty neat if you're looking for that specifically, but I can understand why some people wanted more out of a monster manual. Because it wasn't a book about dragons specifically, but it ended up kind of turning out to be that. But anyways, most of these creatures were quite animalistic in nature, or at the very least slightly above animal intelligence. But the God Slayers kind of stand out here because they are one of the few that was actually quite intelligent in their own right, and didn't necessarily 100% go by the commands of their master. They had their own unique personalities, wants and needs, desires, all that good stuff. They were actually people. We'll get a little bit more to that later though. Today I am going to talk about what these creatures can actually do in combat. Of course some changes that I've made to them that I think make them a little more suitable for 5th edition. And of course some ways that you can actually use them in your game. So, prepare your slaying arrows and roll initiative because it is time for... These guys are huge, literally, and they have a massive pool of hit points to boot. Because of their huge size, meaning they roll a d12 for their hit dice and their pretty substantial constitution score, that means they're going to be able to take a ton of hits. Which is good, because despite their scales and being a dragon, these guys don't wear any armor and have an AC sitting around 15, which is okay. They do augment their armor class by equipping a giant shield, which is often formed out of another dragon's skull. Thus implying that these guys have already killed at least one large dragon and fashioned it into a shield, so that should add to the intimidation factor right away. Like the blue dragons they are spawned from, they are of course immune to lightning, and their bite attack also causes lightning damage. Also, their great sword that they use is enchanted to be able to cause lightning damage whenever they stab someone as well. And because of their multi-attack ability, they are able to bite someone and stab someone with their giant sword once every turn. That's all pretty straightforward stuff up to this point, but these guys also have the relentless trait, which means every time they hit somebody with a melee attack, that creature has to make a DC 23 strength saving throw, and if they fail, they are pushed 15 feet back away from the God Slayer, and they're also knocked prone. This is important because if it hits someone and they fail their save on its first attack, it can then move up close to them and since they're prone now, they can attack them a second time at advantage. And of course we've got its final trait, which is where the God Slayer gets its name from, called Immortal Slayer. This creature has spent its entire life training and fighting against creatures that might actually be a threat against the dragon that spawned it. So basically what this means is it has advantage and deals extra damage to anything that's not native to the material plane, so demons, angels, fiends, whatever it may be. And it also gets this bonus damage against dragons. So any of the metallic good aligned dragons such as gold, silver, copper, bronze, and also any other chromatic dragons that might be rivals to its master. This of course also carries over to dragonborn, 
other dragons spawn, and half dragons too because they are technically dragon blooded creatures. Now it is up for debate if your sorcerer who has dragon blood as their sorcerer's origin is going to be affected by this ability or not, but that is up to you and how you want to call that. Ultimately, these guys are just meant to lay the hurt on all of those creatures. Against an adventuring party, this might not even come into play, but if you have any dragonborn in your party, or players who are playing as some kind of homebrewed or strange dragon-oriented race, this will affect them. Just keep that in mind, because this guy already hits like a truck, and with this added damage and advantage added on to the specific types of creatures, he can be absolutely devastating. Now that's it for this creature as written, and honestly, I think it could make a great addition to pretty much any gaming world. World, especially when dragons are at play, but I wouldn't be done with combat if I didn't at least bring up a few. One of the most iconic dragon abilities that I thought this creature was missing was a breath attack. I mean, even dragon board get access to a breath attack, and they are much weaker in comparison, so I felt like it kind of needed to have one. I was kind of surprised it didn't already have one if I'm being honest, so I just gave it an ability that it can spit a 90 foot line of lightning, which is a weaker version of what an adult blue dragon would be able to do. The second iconic dragon ability that I felt was missing here was the Frightful Presence. So I gave it an action where it can let out a roar, and every creature within 120 feet has to make a wisdom save or fall to being frightened. Of course, like every other instance of Frightful Presence is lasts for one minute and they are allowed to make a save at the end of every one of their turns to negate the effect. And if they succeed on one of those saves, they are immune to this effect for 24 hours. Pretty straightforward. That might not be a huge detriment to a party right away, but it is very thematic and can sometimes sway things in favor of the creature that is frightening everybody. Adding these two new abilities does increase the CR of this creature a little bit, and especially the line breath attack makes it much more deadly, but I think it's worth it and makes it a lot more thematic and interesting. So, now that we have a pretty good grasp on what this creature can do in battle, let's get our very own story going with some... So the first and most obvious use for this creature is to use it as the guardian of a dragon's lair. Specifically a blue dragon. At epic level, an ancient dragon might even have a few of these guys running around. They're excellent minions at this point because they provide somewhat of a challenge and they're a lot more interesting than simply more cultists. And speaking of more cultists, if you happen to be running Horde of the Dragon Queen or better yet Rise of Tiamat, these guys would make great additions to a ton of different encounters. There's a bit in the ecology and lore of the God Slayers where it mentions how Tiamat actually communicates with them through their dreams. And that they believe they are the chosen of Tiamat and they kind of long for the day when Tiamat calls them to action. In the Rise of Tiamat questline, without getting into spoilers, there are several opportunities that would be golden places for you to add one or two or three of these guys in. And the other meta benefit here too is because your players aren't from 5th edition, they probably won't see it coming and it will add a much more memorable element to a module that they might have even run before in the past. One of the differences too in the lore between 4th edition and 3.5 is the fact that these creatures are much more independent and kind of uniquely willed in the 4th edition ecology bit. The 4th edition monster manual doesn't get into it quite as much as the one from 3.5, however it does say that they are known to possibly go rogue at times. So maybe one of these guys runs off on its own and starts up a mercenary band. Or maybe even joins up with a previously existing mercenary band for an exorbitant amount of money. I mean, they are dragonkin after all, so perhaps they still carry some of that lust for gold with them. Or maybe their cause for going rogue is a bit more justified and divine even. As I mentioned, Tiamat calls to them from their dreams, and maybe one of them wakes up one day feeling that it is being called by Tiamat to action. Perhaps it feels the need to rise up against some other force or deific group of enemies. So maybe this rogue god slayer starts amassing followers on a grand crusade in the name of Tiamat against a kingdom or whatever your designated target is. If you really wanted to make one of these guys the big bad evil guy of your campaign, you could even give them some levels of paladin and have Tiamat be their god and make that the ultimate arch evil of your game. Now technically, according to the lore and what we find in the books, of all the dragon spawn, only blue dragon spawn can become god slayers. But there's no reason not to change that. If you want to use one of these creatures in your game but you only have a black dragon nearby or a green dragon, you can simply recolor the God Slayer and make it a minion of that dragon in your world. The only thing I would really change about the creature itself is I would change their immunity and breath attack to the same kind as the dragon that you're aligning it with. So if it's going to be a red God Slayer and rather than breathing a line of lightning, it will simply breathe a cone of fire. 
And if you wanted to, you could even make a version of this creature that was metallic and good aligned. Maybe a golden god slayer or a silver god slayer that's actually an ally to the party and helps them on some kind of quest. I mean, you could even run a whole quest where the players are playing as god slayers if you want and kind of make them a racial class where they're on this big epic adventure fighting against angels and demons or whatever you want. And at the end of the day, if you really just like this monster, but you don't want to get involved with all this lore about dragons and all that other stuff, you can just really ignore all of that and have it set up as a wandering monster for a one-time use combat encounter in the middle of the desert or wherever your party happens to be. And that's fine, they make interesting monsters that might be aligned with other creatures because they are intelligent. If you really wanted to, you could retype it as a giant lizard folk and rather than have it be a 20 foot tall dragon-like creature, maybe it's a 20 foot tall T-Rex folk kind of creature. In that case, I would probably remove the breath weapon and bump its CR down one peg, but that's fine. If that's what you want to do, it couldn't do that. That would make a great encounter for a swampy kind of area, or maybe if you're running Tomb of Annihilation and you have it as some kind of ancient temple guardian, that could be really cool. Anyways, at the end of the day, I think these guys are very fascinating and they're much more than just a giant stack of hit points. They've got a few interesting abilities and ultimately have this very fascinating lore behind them as well, which I find will elevate almost any monster to new levels. If you've ever had one of these guys used against you from some DM in the past, please tell me about it in the comments, or maybe you have plans on how you want to implement this with your game, I'd like to hear about that too. And if you're looking for the stat block, you can find that in the description below, there's a link to the Google document there that will give you everything you need to run this monster in 5th edition. And of course, if you are one of my lovely patrons, you are entitled to the 5th edition monster manual style stat block that I've made up, and posted that onto my Patreon page, so you can find that there if you want to add it to your collection. And while you're down in the description below there, you can find links to the Reddit, Discord, Twitter, all that good stuff. Twitter is generally the best way to get a hold of me if you have something that you need to tell me or post or send my way, uh, as well as Discord. The community there is pretty active and they, I'm sure, will welcome you with open arms if you decide to join us. Anyways, I just want to say thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it and I will see you in the next video. Till then.